Hello and welcome to Saturday Morning Cartoons, the weekly podcast that revisits, reviews, and ridicules some of the world's weirdest animated series. Coming to you from Psychoville, where Finkel's the mayor, I'll be your host, Dave Trumbor. Joining me, as always, my co-host, Sean Pilas, Pet Detective. How's it going, buddy? Ah, uh, David, David, David. I'm doing well, buddy. How about yourself? I'm doing okay. This is uh, our second <laughs> week of the, what, CBS Kids TV morning cartoon block here. What is, go- what is wrong with you, CBS? They, it was one of the more schizophrenic combinations of cartoons that i think i've ever seen we had teenage mutant ninja turtles last week with special uh turtle doctor guest jason woods this week we're talking ace ventura pet detective yes they did make an animated series out of that out of that uh the movie and its sequel who which will we talk we will talk about tonight uh off the top of your head good decision poor decision poor decision now, when I, I probably should have asked an actual question. Uh, when you say poor decision, do you mean poor decision for them to make this show or poor decision for us to watch it? Both. Yes. The answer is yes. Correct. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what CBS was thinking or whoever the production company was that, that decided to make this. I guess they already had the rights to it, so they were just like, nah, eh, fuck it, let's go for it. You, you realize that at that point, so many things were being adapted and so many things were being thrown around in the 90s and... You know, it, it just it made sense to for for small titular characters to get weird spinoffs to do, you know, bizarre shows. And, and, and that's that's fine. Everybody, everybody does this and they take a risk with it and they sure. hope for the best. It, it's it boils down to, you know, at that time when we were kids and we would have watched this on a Saturday morning. Was it enjoyable? Probably not. Do I remember watching this? I remember the episodes being on a little bit at some point. Right. I remember its existence. That's about it. Exactly. Yeah. I think I probably either suffered through this show waiting for another show to start, but ultimately I, I, didn't, I, I didn't really watch this. And so what happens is that we are taking on that task. Dave, we are taking on that task. We are the tastemakers. Of, of revisiting this show as adults, we, we, we talk about the fact that we love it when we have guests that are on that have never watched the show that we're talking about. We are talking about a show where we are coming in as pure and as white as new fallen snow. And let's see how many poop and fart jokes we can make <laughs> within a solid hour's worth of time. Just ruin that purity. Now, now Sean, actually, I, I think you watched, what, two episodes here? I did. I watched tonight. two episodes. I watched a third one that had a very special reason why we watched a third one, but we I won't get into that just yet. Yeah. I don't know how you did that. Uh, a <laughs> you lot are of, a stronger human being than I am. A lot of alcohol. Look, we, we here at Saturday Morning Cartoons watch these shows so you don't have to. That's kind of our sub-motto here. We watch it so you guys don't have to. So, without any further ado, I think we'll get into the history of this one. Sean's going to walk you guys through how this show exactly got made and who was responsible for this mess. So, I, I feel... As we're getting into the history with this, it should be a little bit more highbrow than it, it normally would. Definitely. So uh, indulge me, dear listener, if you would for a moment. Ace Ventura Pet Detective is an animated television series based on the film of the same name. The series is produced by Morgan Creek Productions and Nelvana for Warner Brothers Pictures Television. It aired for two seasons from 1995 to 1997 on CBS. The third season and reruns of the previous episodes aired on Nickelodeon from 1999 to 2000. The series starred Michael Dangerfield as Ace Ventura, and Seth MacFarlane was among the writers over the course of the show's run. Despite running in a time slot after The Mask, another popular Jim Carrey-based cartoon, and a crossover with that show in the series finale, The Ace Man Cometh, the series failed to gain a large audience, surprisingly enough. Ultimately, both The Mask and Ace Ventura were cancelled. A new and completely different season of the series ran on Nickelodeon. Fantastic. I feel classier already just for you having read it in such a manner. I hope our listeners out there feel classy as well. If you, uh, if you guys out there haven't done so yet, please... Sit back, relax in your favorite leather-backed lounge chair. Kick up your feet. Put your bear slippers on. Um, you know, light that fire. Possibly and, uh, get a pipe out. Any kind of pipe will do. 
tobacco. Pour yourself a, a cognac or a, a possibly a small snifter of port. Yeah. Oh, a port would go really good right now, actually. Might I suggest a silk mm. robe to adorn your bodies? <laughs> I'm going to let that one go. So one of the reasons <laughs> that Sean read uh, the history in such a manner is because actually this Wikipedia entry is one of my favorites because whoever or whatever collective group decided to take their time to write about Ace Ventura Pet Detective animated series, you can feel their disdain and sort of pretentious <laughs> nature just flooding through the history and synopsis. I'm, I'm going to do my best to, uh, to bring that to life in the synopsis here. So these you are not my it. words. These are from Wikipedia, and it is, uh, I will read it as it is written. As it is written, so it shall be. <laughs> All right, here's a synopsis for Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, courtesy of Wikipedia. The series is a sequel of the Ace Ventura movies. The titular character is a goofy private investigator with a predilection for animals of all species. Many of the characters from the movie were retained, though not voiced by their original actors. While the original movies already had a strongly cartoonish comedic aesthetic, they were eclipsed by the slapstick and garish humor of the cartoon. The show was rife with toilet humor and anachronisms. One episode centered around the Egyptian Mao claiming it to be an extinct breed of cat when in fact they are not, displaying similar humor to his later series. Uh, I don't really think that told you anything about what the show is actually about, so if you're not familiar with the movies, Jim Carrey played a character named Ace Ventura who was a pet detective. He was wacky, he was crude, he had a lot of crazy one-liners, a lot of physical humor. And he eventually saved the day by rescuing uh, missing pets in the end. I just love this, this synopsis. It is so well written. You can really tell <laughs> the moments where the person who was writing this was like, I am going to skewer every fiber <laughs> of their body. Every, every possible choice that they have made. <laughs> Eclipsed by the slapstick and garish humor of the cartoon. <laughs> What for, Ace Ventura? What for? And they will know my name. Anonymous <laughs> exactly. editor. Anonymous <laughs> editor. I, be, I bet, like, the, the username is just something like, just, it has to be something ridiculous. Whoever wrote this and edited it, like, their username has to be something that kind of contradicts the language that was actually used. It's probably, like, Hottis Shadius. I want to say oh, hottis shadius, or perhaps uh, pectoralis majoricus. You're killing me with these. Look, I'm, I'm going to because... say right now that the, uh, the mystery of this pretentious editor is more interesting than anything that happens in the cartoon we're going to talk about tonight. So if you're interested, go to the Ace Ventura cartoon Wikipedia page and look up this editor. If it's you, we want to hear from you because you seem like fun. Uh, but without... Act yeah, actually, I'm, I'm going to throw out a challenge Ooh, in addition challenge. to this. If, uh, if you go out and you read the Ace Ventura yes. Wikipedia page for this cartoon, uh, update it with additional language that would seem as, uh, I don't know, as, as highbrow as yeah, you possibly could. Get, get real exactly. florid out there. Just really lay on the, the, the academia on this my goal is to make this the smartest or at least sound like, the smartest exactly the, I'm, 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 look i'm trying to make this wicked smart so i'm really um, I'm, I'm 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 counting on you guys to go out Do and us a solid. edit this wikipedia page please just edit this wikipedia page yeah. you're on wikipedia line anyway so look just literally ahead. no one is looking at this page except for <laughs> sean and myself and anyone listening to this show right now <laughs> you guys we are the only people who are keeping this page alive let's just have fun with this one have guys. some fun with it go out there and then the send us your um your edits saturday morning cartoons at gmail.com morning with a u send them please. over to us and in the future, you know what? If, if we tell you an episode we're going to cover ahead of time or a show we're going to cover ahead of time, feel free in advance to go add some crazy information to that Wikipedia page. I'll read it. I don't vet anything. I don't know the difference. <laughs> I don't fact check nah, this I stuff. I do that all day long. I don't need to do it for the podcast. So if yeah. you, go trip me up. It'll be great. I'll have a good laugh. It'll be good times. <laughs> but moving on with the show, let's, uh, let's jump into the theme song here because... Um, <laughs> It's not good. So as we've <laughs> talked about, the theme song kind of gives you a, a taste, an introduction, an idea of what the show's going to be about, what the tone's going to be, what the humor level's going to be like. This one 
this one, it's pretty forgettable. Surprisingly forgettable. Surprisingly enough, I will say, though, that in terms of the tone, it really does a fantastic job of letting you know exactly what is about to happen in this show. Yeah, it's not you lying. Are, you, <laughs> you are about to, because there was a lion in it. Is that why you said there's that? A, yeah, there's uh, a lot of animals. I'm going to try to work on um, my animal my, puns tonight. Just get those puns in. Not lying. Uh, uh, you can tell that there, there's an extreme amount of animals that are acting in an anthropomorphic fashion. Yes. Uh, you can tell that there is going to be an excessive amount of fart humor and fart jokes that are going on. Yeah, the aforementioned then, toilet humor. Yes. And then, and then to round it out, well, I'll say, I, I, like, I feel like fart humor is different from just toilet humor. Because it can, it can take place outside of the toilet? Correct. Got it. And so I feel like... I feel feel like free to humor. elucidate that fact, listeners, on the Wikipedia page. <laughs> the difference between fart humor, toilet humor, crude jokes, any of the above. Feel free. Go crazy. Look, if we, get, if we give you stubs to update yes, the wiki article please. on, feel free to do that. Um, and again, you can just screen cap it on your phone. Send it on over to us, send Saturday Morning Cartoons. Yeah. Um, we will be happy to read them on the next episode. We will <laughs> update, yes, we will update this episode with new Wikipedia <laughs> updates. Hot takes as they come in. Oh, I love Hot this takes idea. of a 25-year-old, 22-year-old uh, cartoon show. Yeah. But I, I feel like, I feel like for fart humor, I feel like it is something that can happen in a public setting sure. to kind of make yourself a, a pariah, to kind of further that, that idea of that person being an outcast and being socially unacceptable. Well, well let, me, like, let me ask you this then. If I were to, if we were in a setting, a social setting, sure, sure. wherever, out in public, and I just, uh, in the middle of conversation, bent mm-hmm. over and kind of like put my head kind of between my ankles, and yeah. then grab my butt cheeks. Uh, I'm still wearing clothes at this point. Grab you my... know, I've seen you do this before, so I mean, I'm, it's not hard to. Imagine. Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just saying, like when I do sure, this, sure. it's not, it's not an if situation. It's a yeah. when, when, yeah, condition. Uh, grab my butt cheeks and pull them apart in a in a rhythmic manner to make it seem like my anus is talking to you. Um, what is your normal response? And where would you? How would you categorize that type of humor? If it's my humor. normal, sometimes response, it's just how I talk, and it, it understandably yeah. so. What I normally think right. is Dave's butt makes a really funny Muppet. It's not wrong. And, and it, it, yeah, it's not wrong. And it works. I, I, didn't, sometimes I didn't get think, cleared for ABC, but I mean, did no. try. And that's honestly, <laughs> I've been told that's what counts. Sometimes I think, is that is Dave's butt Statler or is it Waldorf? And then the final I kind of for round both. out. I mean, as you should. Yeah. And the idea of rounding it out. You know, when I see you kind of do an improv mm-hmm. about it, I'm like, this would be funnier if I put two googly eyes on his butt cheeks. Now, I mean, you can kind of say that for anything. Uh, you can say that for everything. But it doesn't make it not true. <laughs> Fact of the podcast. So the podcast. where would you categorize that brand of humor? Is that fart humor? <sighs> Is it toilet humor? Is it just crude humor in general? I, yeah, because like I, I think the fart, I think a fart humor, I think a fart joke um, I, I think fart humor in general, holistically, is actually the the act or the the like is the actual flatulence. So even if it's you like know? simulated or, flatulence or, from an armpit, say. See, that's hard because because yeah. we, we know that that does happen in one of these episodes. Oh, indeed, this is why I, I bring it up. But it happened in a bathroom. I feel like the distinction with this is the location. And as a I teaser, like, we should mention that it, it took place roughly two thousand years ago in a Roman emperor's bathroom which looked conspicuously like a modern bathroom today there's a tease I, for the episode I, if you want to know how we get there i almost threw my ipad out the fucking window <laughs> i was so angry <laughs> like watching it i just went what the oh god mm, seth mcfarlane yeah that was all it his just, fault yeah i know oh so real, was... so real quick then i know i'll save that till we talk about the episodes which one we watched and why uh but for right now, if you've lost track, we were talking about the theme song. Um, right. So, yeah. So, so I, I, I should have mentioned so that it, it laid out the tones, got the animals, got the fart Yeah, humor. in summation, uh, for the fart humor, I feel like fart humor takes place in a social setting. Okay. I feel like bathroom humor is location-based and takes place specifically in the bathroom. But it's so a Venn have, diagram of sorts. They can all kind of cross right, over right. each other. Okay. You, can, you can have a union between the two, as we saw in one of the episodes right. that we watched tonight. But I feel like it is very location based. Okay, so listeners, in terms of the your scenario. second task tonight: make that Venn diagram, 
You don't have to clear it with us. Post it directly to the Wikipedia page. <laughs> and then screen cap it before they take it down. Um, <laughs> that's what I'd like to see. But yeah, I agree. Oh I mean, God. it's a lot of just like silly slapstick bathroom kind of level humor. Just simple, su- stupid, silly stuff for little kids. It's a, you, have a, you have a skunk that obviously skunks have a defense mechanism where they spray uh, a scent that repels other people. In this instance, it is a green, nauseous, like noxious gas. Yeah, I don't think sort that's of biologically envelops, accurate. I wanted to ask uh, our turtle doctor, but he's unfortunately not with us this week. Right. And so, you know, it's, we, we, we see these things and then we see a bunch of animals lined up to use a hydrant because animals have to pee on hydrants. And that's how this works. And it's just, you see these things and you're just like, this is, this feels not, it feels, if there was something lower than low hanging fruit, this show is going for you mean it. The rotten fruit that's just laying on the ground. It's just crab apples <laughs> on the fucking ground. It's just that have been like run over with cars and like Winnebago's and shit like that, or tractors and nobody cares. And it's, it's ridiculous. So I didn't, <laughs> I'm trying to like, <laughs> Pin down your feelings on the theme song. I did not enjoy it at all. (laughs) Good. I guess. Okay. I guess I could have figured that out. So I, in summation, did not enjoy it, but it gives you a clear indication of the anthropomorphic nature in this universe of animals in general. And it really gives you a a consistent reminder that there's going to just be a lot of bathroom humor in general throughout this entire show fair enough i think for me when it comes to the theme song i want to see how how kind of like hooky it is how memorable it is this one's not memorable at all i literally just tried to look up the lyrics i i can't even remember they basically just say ace ventura a number of times and at one point they say he doesn't even have a gun and i'm like i (laughs) all right whatever this happened i wish i did now yeah after watching this show they probably kept the guns away from him for a variety of reasons, but uh, yeah, this theme song is not memorable. It's not catchy. You probably won't find it on top, you know, top three hundred best cartoons of nineteen ninety four theme songs. Uh, it's not good. Whatever the opposite of an earworm is. Yeah, it's literally whatever is in your brain trying to crawl out and escape the memory of this theme song. It is what's happening right now, and that leads into the rest of the show. <laughs> One interesting thing now, as a fan of the movies, were you were you a fan of the movies at all? Are you a fan of Jim I, Carrey at all? Yeah, I, I, oh, okay. I, love, I love Jim Carrey. Okay. I really I enjoyed a lot. Of, I, I enjoyed Jim Carrey all the way back from when he was on In Living Color and he was, pay, or he was billed as James Carrey. Oh, James Carrey. During that James time. James Carrington. And I just, I loved sketch comedy. Right. And so when In Living Color came on on Sunday nights on Fox, like I would watch the hell out of it. In fact, I would put blankets and pillows around the door like around the door frame of my bedroom so that when, when you started I turned fires, on the, the smoke wouldn't get out. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Look, I'm trying to asphyxiate myself. <laughs> Jeez, that's not where I was going, but okay. Oh no. Well, okay. Hey. Fair enough. Uh, I, I'm trying to, <laughs> I was trying to watch the show. And so I had like a really, I had a small television in my room. Yeah. And so when I would turn it on, like, you know, the, the glow from the giant, like CRT cathode ray, and that uh, sweet, sweet radiation TV, leaking into uh, our faces. Like I would get really close to the television and I would turn the volume down to like a one or a two and put my ear like next to the TV. Were you not supposed to be watching it? I was, I was not. My mom was I very... I wasn't either. I wasn't my either. My mom was very against me watching uh, In Living Color and The Simpsons. Yes, same, same. She thought that that was a show that I should not be watching. But at the so, same time, like they watched it downstairs. I was like, let me just, you know, family time. Let me just, yeah. I want to watch Fire Marshal Bill and the Fly Girls. Let me just, oh my God, come hang out. But I mean, all of those, all of those characters that he had that were just so insane and so well done and, and just and so, so heightened beyond a level that I had ever seen, uh, having been somebody who grew up on uh, Saturday Night Live. Right. And, and, then, and then Mad TV, when it came out in right. the 90s, it was, it was something where, like, his characterization sometimes that he had in the late 80s, early 90s, you were just like, this is nuts. Like, yeah, he this, was so it, This far has to be a crazy top. person. Right. Which is why I think it actually does make sense that they were like, oh, let's take these successful movies and characters that he's made, because they're already basically cartoons, like live action cartoons, and let's just right. make them into a cartoon. It just didn't quite translate because they didn't have the, the humor down. Because this was meant for kids, and they were still trying to slip some like adult jokes and stuff in there. It just didn't really work. But I get that the idea of transitioning a very cartoonish character into an actual cartoon kind of makes sense. It just, the execution wasn't there. 
What I really yeah. loved was the fact that a lot of the characters from the movies actually made their way into the cartoon, for better or right. for worse. So you've, uh, you've already got Ace, obviously. Now he's definitely not voiced by Jim Carrey. He's voiced by uh, Michael... Um, Dangerfield. Dangerfield. I almost said Derringer for some reason. Uh, yeah. Well, did you know so this, was, this was interesting yeah. when I was uh, looking up uh, Dangerfield? Um, did you know that he did ADR for Ace Ventura When Nature Calls? Did he so actually? He did. And so if you're unfamiliar with what ADR is, is that when they, they have a lot of like, uh, if they want to throw in some like ad libs when the actor is, not, uh, is off screen, if they want to throw in some additional lines, uh, you know, if they want to try to punch up a bit in some way, shape, or form, they'll have actors come in and instead of having them on camera, which requires everybody to get a set, they have to have the entire production crew that's available. They can just do something called ADR, which they just they record that actor's voice and you hear it off screen and you sort of just see maybe the reaction of of somebody or the reaction of the the environment in some cases. Right. Um, and so this this was the case is that Michael Dangerfield went and did ADR for Ace Ventura in this movie oh, cool. when Jim Carrey wasn't available. And so you would think that he had that voice down Ooh, maybe for the live action or for like short things like just making weird sounds or something by the way adr stands for i believe additional dialogue replacement and it's something yes. that neil kaplan mentioned in our last uh our interview with him as well so in case that threw Correct. anybody out there that's sean had a great definition uh example of it that's what that is yeah it happens all the time live action cartoons doesn't just have to be animation it happens all the time yeah um but yeah so that's pretty cool i didn't know that uh, you would think that then he would have tried to sound more like Jim Carrey for this cartoon. <laughs> I, don't, but, I don't get it. I don't get it. I mean, some of it was like, he's definitely not Jim Carrey. At parts, he sounds like William Shatner. At parts, he sounds like Bugsy. And that's half because he's trying to do these cartoonish voices. But it's also half because I don't think he ever really like found Ace Ventura's voice. I don't know. It just didn't seem, it just seemed like a guy who was off his meds. And it's not from lack of trying. No. This guy had three seasons to be able to get yeah. this down. Yeah. You know, he could have <clears throat> called up at any point. He could have called up Robert Paulson and been like, hey, can we talk mask? <laughs> and like, can we just talk Jim Carrey in general? Oh, and we're going we we to get to that later on, too. It's a good can we, can we? Can we get this down? Like, can we, can we work on this? And as Jim artists, can we, can we maybe just have our agents reach out to his and just a five-minute phone call. Yeah. We'll record it, and we'll just use it in order to get into character, yeah. into these voices sometimes. And it just, I'll be honest with you, this impersonation of, which this is what it is, it's not Ace Ventura, it's a lazy person's impersonation of what Jim Carrey. And, it's, and what the definition, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, it's what your asshole friend sounds like at a party after a couple drinks when he's like, hey, you remember Ace Ventura Pet Detective? And you're like, don't, don't do it. Don't do the don't impression, Garrett. Do don't it. do the impression, Garrett. Garrett's He's like, worst. oh, rainy then. And you're like, I told you not to uh, fucking do it. Now leave my house. And, and what the actor would probably say is, look, I didn't want to exactly mimic Jim Carrey, who already did the character in the movies. I wanted to make it my own thing, which whatever, that, it's fine. And I, I, will, I will tell you as an actor and as somebody who has done stuff like this before, that's a bullshit answer. <laughs> Fair enough. That is a bull fucking shit answer. Um, I'm sorry, you took an existing IP where somebody had clearly defined what that character is over two major motion pictures. You filled in as the voice of this character, not as Jim Carrey, you filled in as Ace Ventura. Mm -hmm. And then, did you know that there was an Ace Ventura Jr. movie that came out? Uh, yeah, with, um, oh, what's his name? Oh, no, I was thinking of The Mask Jr. Or The Mask, no, no. The Son of The Mask. Uh, 14 years after the last major motion picture for Ace Ventura, they decided to release an Ace Ventura Jr. movie. Mm. I don't know who was clamoring after almost a decade and a half to get probably whoever a held the Junior rights. movie. Ugh, that's it's probably insane. probably was it Morgan, whatever the whatever the production company was, right? Morgan Creek. God, that's who that's done did it. Or but, Nelvana. But let's let's just say, okay, so he is now the cartoon version of Ace Ventura. I like the fact that they still have Spike. They have Spike the monkey in the show. I like that they have his uh, jerk of a, of a landlord, Mr. Shikadance, who was one of my favorites from the, the cartoons. Or, sorry, from the movies. Um, I like that Emilio and Aguado. Emilio yeah. was played by Tone Loke in the movies. It was Ace's friend at the police department. And then Aguado is kind of like the fat antagonist cop. 
Um, but I think that was it. Those were the only ones that I kind of picked up that were from the movies, but they showed up fairly often, fairly frequently. Yeah. I thought that correct. was kind of cool. The, you want to talk animation style? Did you have any other characters that you want to talk about real quick? No, I think that really covers it yeah. pretty well. I, I, the animation style, uh, did you ever watch, um, it was the Proud Family? Uh, was that a Nicktoon? No, I want to say, I, I don't remember. No, I'm looking. At I'm up. thinking of Wild Thornberries for some reason. That was a Nicktoon. Uh, the Proud Family sounds family. familiar, but I can't, I can't place it in my head. Like, I don't know what it would have looked like. Um, yeah. but I will say for this one, we, I'll tease the, uh, I'll tease the episodes we're going to talk about tonight. So we're going to watch the first ever episode called the reindeer hunter, where you watched an episode that was actually written by Seth MacFarlane of family guy fame and other things, uh, called ACE in time. And then I actually watched the final episode of the mask animated series because it was a crossover episode special with Ace Ventura. So you are a brave soul. You are a brave, brave soul. It was not good. It was crazy, but not good in a good way. Uh, it was interesting to see two Jim Carrey creations on screen, and honestly, I bring that up because that really made the animation style of Ace Ventura, it was, it was a great contrast to The Mask. The Mask, believe it or not, for as cartoonish as that gets, had a much more kind of like realistic style of animation to the characters than Ace Ventura did, which is nuts. So Ace Ventura is still very like cartoonish, he doesn't look anything like an actual person, he's got like super, super thin limbs, and he's kind of like got that drawn out chin and the crazy hair. So it's just Jim Carrey, but exaggerated in all possible ways, which he already is an exaggeration of himself. He already is an exaggeration of a human being. And then they went and just really cartoonified him. So that's kind of the look that we're going for here. Did you find Proud Family? Uh, yeah, it was a Disney Channel. Uh, See, I never, I never it was watched a Disney, Disney Channel, Channel cartoon. Stuff. Never watched now Disney the, Channel the re- stuff. The reason I bring it up is because uh, a lot of the background animation yeah. reminded me of the Proud Family uh, in this particular cartoon because it, it's a very, a very angular, very geometric hmm. in its shape, and and it's like like a, like a very simple color palette to kind of peg in and and like block out all those those shapes. And so it wasn't anything that got like too detailed, mm-hmm. but it gave you enough in terms of. Uh, like texture and contrast with a lot of the other things that were in the environment, like very like distinct color choices that were used to con- like to contrast like the roof and the side of the building and the windows that were used. And so I felt like that was uh, kind of present in, in some of this. And so that's, that's what made me, that's what reminded me of the show. The proud family was just a lot of the background. Okay. Interesting. And the, the, the content and the actual character animation in no way, shape, or form Got it. reminded me so of So just the, the visuals. Thing. Just the visuals, But I think yes. for people who haven't, you know, haven't seen this cartoon to kind of give them an idea of what the visuals we're talking about, I think that really helps. Um, I'll say one more thing about character before we jump into the episode here, but Spike, you would think as a monkey sidekick, kind of like Milo with the mask, you got Spike with Ace Venture. You would think that Spike would be like way more helpful and like friendly and like, on the side of Ace Ventura more than he is, he tends to just be like a straight up monkey. Like he doesn't, he just eats all the time. He poops a lot. He doesn't. He throws up on people. He throws up on people. He doesn't necessarily do what Ace wants him to do. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. That Carries he's just around like a, cartoon a walk man. Monkey. Yeah. Yeah. In, in ancient Rome. Yeah. All right. You want to get into Reindeer Hunter is. here? I mean, I really don't, but let's get in. Well, it's interesting I kinda, because. Because I kind of want to get into Because this was it. actually based on the Oscar winning movie the deer hunter uh so <laughs> i couldn't even get through that one um <laughs> so, that would be great if this is just a shot for shot remake of the deer hunter ace ventura and spike squaring off over a over a table with a revolver on it oh god and it's, it's mao. three and a half hours long screaming mao at each other all right yeah uh so no has nothing to do with deer hunter but it does have something to do with reindeer Notably, Santa's reindeer, because in this world, Santa is a real person. And kids, if you're listening at home, in in our world, he's also a real person. So I want to, you bring up an excellent point right now, Dave, which is, which is something that our guest last week, Dr. Jason Woods brought up, which is, I really like it when they give us an idea of exactly what the rules of this universe are, and then they play within those parameters. And that's so extremely important in these cartoons, because you know, you, you, you are being asked to, uh, to take a leap of faith and, and extend disbelief to a particular extent 
And so having these rules defined up top, I think is great. So this is the first rule is that like mythological or made up <laughs> fairy tale creatures exist. Rule number one, Santa Claus is real. <laughs> Straight Santa out Claus of the gates, he's the first person you see. So, and I, I would say like along with that, like there's the potential that like other cryptids, right. like or other things that are like within that universe, other like cryptological uh you know monsters or, or, or creatures can possibly exist so that that extends the universe to like yetis uh you know lesser known like uh, abominable snowmen bigfoot uh jersey devil and i love so that you're staying these... in like the sasquatch related field of i don't know i'm just <laughs> going down the family like tree specific. of the squatch i don't know how you go from santa claus to sasquatch and then just stay well, there no, no, I... I think that there, like, there's, there's a very specific reason, and I bring these okay. up, is not because of Santa Claus in general, but because these are all creatures. These are all particularly what we kind of define as sort of like have animalistic tendencies. Okay. And so in my brain, I'm just like, oh, we have a pet detective yeah. who's a little bit insane. Yeah. It seems like for some of these things that like, you know, possibly they would interact with Ace given an episode or given the premise of an episode there should sure. be something plausible that could happen in his reality it also opens up the possibility for crazy things like you know time travel or extraterrestrial visits or any other kind of stuff that's sort of outside the it's not a realistic show right it's already hyper right. exaggerated with the character and then it goes beyond that and just introduces things like santa claus magic time travel science fiction stuff so it's kind of anything goes so, and I think that that's important because you very clearly brought up, maybe without even knowing it, Dave, sort of the, the second rule of this universe that I was able to pull out, which was just, this is very much a cartoonish uh, nature in terms of possibly the physics that are going yes, on. Because in no, way, in no way, shape, or form do they adhere to what we consider to be the basic laws of physics, because clearly you could not drop somebody from a helicopter 200 feet in the air and have them smash their face off of something and still live. But then, oddly enough, have the villains in it question how you are still alive, mm. given the set of circumstances that you went but through. See, and I, like, think, I think once they're in the simulation, they don't necessarily know what the rules of it are, maybe. That's, that's fair. That's yeah, fair. I think, I think that's what it is. So, I mean, if you guys... No, never mind. I was going to ask our listeners out there to do some tests with helicopters, but I'd, I'd prefer that they not do that. Why would you? Please don't. <laughs> prefer that they don't do that. Just write it in the Wikipedia page. Oh, boy. So, so we, yeah, what, what's, our, what's our kind of uh, our launching off point here? So we get to this moment where Santa has touched down on a roof, as Santa does. In Miami, and of all places. He, yeah, right, in Miami. He's bitching about the heat. Oh, I hate which the is humidity. What everybody in Miami does. Yep, yep. So he... Gets that point where he's, you know, he, he is a rather uh, rotund gentleman. And As so he Santa is forcing his be. way yeah. down the chimney. And in that moment where he has finally gotten some relief down that brick prison that he's going through, <laughs> uh, uh, the reindeer that he has, uh, he has greeted and said hello to that are patiently waiting up on the roof, you find that there is an, uh, an abductor Ooh, a shadowy, that is about to. shadowy figure. Approaches. Exactly, that is about to holding sort of like a shadowy sack, yeah, like a, a bag. Shadow like sack. A, let's like get gross, but like he's holding like you know something that he's going to evidently scoop up reindeer in a bag. Yep. I didn't know that that was a thing. Well, I guess it's like a hammer space bag. So if we're if yeah, we're, you know, if we've already got Santa and flying reindeer here in this world, then what's what's wrong with the shadow sack? Yeah, stuff them in there. Yeah. Uh, and and kids uh, at home again, don't worry, everything's going to turn out fine. But I will say that Rudolph was not there. So Rudolph was somewhere else chilling, probably waiting for like a stormy night or something. So Rudolph is fine. He's the important one. Don't worry about the rest of them. <laughs> Jesus. He's fine. Playing a little reindeer favoritism? Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. He was picked on as a kid. He deserves uh, his status that he's earned. No, that's fair enough. The other ones are just here work a day reindeer. You can pick them up anywhere. <laughs> they hang out at the Home Depot asking for work around Christmas. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Damn reindeer. Fair. Build a wall. <laughs> Moving on. All right. So after <laughs> after we've kind of gotten to the launch off point of what the conflict in the show is going to be, we're introduced to Ace, right? And we're introduced to Ace in kind of a cool way. And I meant that not as a pun, but it is actually a pun because he's got his air conditioning turned way the hell up on Christmas Eve in Miami, so that it's actually snowing and like covered in ice and snow all over his place in his apartment. 
Now, why? But, yeah, there has to be, there be, has to be a reason. good reason. Yeah. There Not just because be it's Christmas reason. time, which is nice exactly. and festive, but there's probably more to the story. I mean, it's probably because you're, you're housing penguins. Mr. Popper's penguins. Holy shit, uh, this was the, this was holy the preview fucking God. to Mr. Popper's penguins. Oh my God. Wow, that was like an actual aha moment for the both of us, which is really sad and uh, prophetic at the same time. Mr. Popper's Mr. Penguins. Mr. Popper's Penguins. Don't go watch that movie. Don't see it. However, if you want to go to their Wikipedia page and write <laughs> in that this episode of Ace Ventura Pet Detective was the precursor, spiritual prequel, to Mr. Popper's Penguins, I will allow that, and I encourage or, it. Or I will also encourage if you want to go on the Mr. Popper's Penguins page and say exactly. that we should build a wall uh, to keep Jim Carrey, we should build a wall against Canada to keep Jim Carrey from coming back into making movies. I'm also fine with that if too. If we just like build a Jim Carrey shaped wall so that only Jim Carrey can't come through it, him self congratulating himself over the fact that that's there, that would be enough to distract him for Ever. decades. Forever. Till death. Ever. Till death. Wow. Good time. Mr. Pappy's Penguins. <sighs> anyway, so. I can't believe that. So we've got the penguins in the apartment, which have nothing to do with anything except that it's funny and that it exists to piss off Mr. Shikadance, the aforementioned evil landlord who, right. Honestly, this guy's in this case, he's just trying to do his job for whatever reason. His, uh, he still allows Ace to live here at this point, but since he is like the room next to Ace and one of his walls is currently frozen because Ace has the room so cold, he's got a bone to pick with him. Right. Right. The hilarious thing is that Mr. Shikadance, out of everybody in this episode, probably has the most amount of physical harm inflicted upon him. I would think. I mean, I agree with you. There were, there were moments where I, I honestly, in my notes, I wrote down, oh my God, did Ace Ventura actually just kill a man? He basically just murdered this old grouchy man, and it's no wonder this guy's so pissed off. He basically runs yeah. him over with his car. He leaves him hanging from a billboard. The guy gets crushed underneath the weight of uh, spoiler alert it's a like santa sleigh that like, like falls out of the sky him. yeah yeah with multiple people in it and basically yeah. crushes him the guy should be dead but mr shika dance i just thought it was a great easter egg and i'm assuming that he shows up fairly often i'm assuming he's i'm assuming he has to be a reoccurring character yes, has to be so they kill him every episode because it's hilarious for kids so now we've got missing reindeer we've been introduced to ace ventura so of course Santa in a bar in Miami somewhere just happens to call Ace Ventura and ask him to come come down and help find his missing reindeer. Right? That's pretty much where we are. Do right. you if if some if I called you up or if I called you up from say a payphone so you didn't know it was me, and I said, Sean Paul Ellis, pet detective, my name's Santa Claus. Someone stole my reindeer. Oh, please come help. What Click. would your reaction be? Oh, you just straight <laughs> hang up. You just straight hang up on Santa Claus. <laughs> I mean, truthfully, if I didn't know what the number was, I probably would not have picked it up. Fair enough. <laughs> so Let's I'm say you had a few and you were talking to Santa and you just wanted to be like, there's a slight possibility this could be Santa Claus. So maybe if I test him, I can find out for, for real. Mm. How would you go about testing me? I would challenge him by saying, what present did you gift me last year? That's pretty smart. I think that's actually pretty clever. Especially if I he gave so you too. something weird like a stationary, like, hairdresser salon chair thingy yeah this show is so it's, weird it's it's incredible i mean you know you realize like the i, I want to say this just about the design of ace ventura the things that have been like retained yes about ace ventura are chip sort tooth. of the right the chip tooth we have the the enormous uh quaffed hair you know, uh, that sort of has, like, it, it seems to defy gravity at all points. Which I do like that they actually set up a joke at the end of this episode, so I, I will give them that. It's not funny, but I like that they at it's least had the, four, the, you know, the forethought and the foresight to set it up. Right. It just didn't land. Uh, we have the, we have the, uh, like the... Like the Hawaiian like the, shirt. The, the under, we have the undershirt. Yeah. We have, like, the white undershirt, like the white tank top undershirt with the very extremely loud Hawaiian shirt that's over top of it that's never buttoned, so it just kind of flails. And then we have what I can only describe as being like red and gold striped MC Hammer pants. Yeah, pretty much. 
that kind of go with like a like a poorly drawn belt. Basically, just like a complete that's cinched around his waist. Yeah, contrasted mess. As uh, yeah. as he gets called out for later in the episode, I do right. love that they included his car though, his real jalopy of a car with like the shattered windshield and like <laughs> right. that was pretty funny, a funny little touch. All right, so now so, we've got we've got Ace on the case, helping Santa find his reindeer. Right, right. I I also like that they included his kind of weird investigative technique of just like tasting things at the scene of the crime. Yeah, and just yeah. Eating stuff and and like doing the thing in the wind. And all that stupid, like, pseudo fake tracker bullshit you always see in movies. I like that they at least brought it into the cartoon, too. That was fun. Right. It's interesting to see, like, those, those little tidbits. And if you're thinking to yourself, I wonder what else they brought over from the movie yeah. into said cartoon. Well, every single catchphrase uh, that you've ever heard in any Ace Ventura movie. Every single the, one. Like, when he calls people a loser, but he does it like a, le who's yeah. He says that constantly. The the all righty then is said a thousand times. You know what really Whenever, irritated me what? was that on each and every episode that we watched, they had to stuff in the "do not go in there." Yep, they had to cram it in each and every time, and only a, once did it actually like make sense within the context of the show. Absolutely, and it they still did wasn't the, funny. It was never. No. I mean, it was funny when he did it in the movie the first time. that one time. First time I ever saw uh, it. it was the funny time. We, we have the uh, the spank you very much uh, uh, greeting that he has for everybody, yeah. which he says to everybody at all points in time, including a Roman slave girl. Exactly. That's another tease. Uh, we have the um, he talks about the fact that uh, he he mentions multiple times, and 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 watching this, I was like, I don't know that he can get away with saying this, but he will say that he is a pet dick, a private dick to people. To people, yeah, he's a private dick, and it's it, on and his then, license uh, plate. Um, Spoiler alert, the mask actually says it too. He says, now where is that private dick? So they do like saying that a lot. Uh, Dave, you've, we've already talked about the fact that the butt talk is prevalent. And we have the, the, the driving with his head out the window. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, that is every, like, that's every possible <laughs> that's the quirk. entire movie. <laughs> yeah. That's every possible quirk that would have been laid out over a 90-minute feature film. You're correct. We saw all of that within the first eight and a half minutes of this cartoon. Pretty much. Like, they are desperate to remind you who Ace Ventura is. See, and it's, it's such a sad, that is such a sad statement because that means the rest of the show is just going to be like empty fluff where they don't know what the hell they're doing. The plot for is. this thing is one of the weirder, <laughs> one of the weirder ones we're, we're going to talk about. Because after Ace, he kind of goes through this list of, uh, it's technically Santa's naughty list, right? Which is like thousands of people long. He just goes through this list and he just goes up to people and demands that they give the reindeer back. They literally just slam doors in his face for an extended montage that probably goes through at least 25 different people, 25 different doors, and then try to wrap it all up with a stinger with something. There's like a giant sign that says big door slamming jamboree. Yeah. It's like, that's not funny. You're just, okay, but let's just. Let's just move on. Yeah. And he and even at one point p- catches like an art thief in the middle of stealing Correct. a bunch of like priceless art. And then it's just like, I don't care about this. Where's the reindeer? So he's not even a very good detective in general. He's very single minded and going after these reindeer. That's it. And in and, and, and doing so, this is like the weird deus ex machina uh, that you, you don't expect that he breaks in on this art thief who's about to commit an actual caper. Yeah. And the art thief sort of points out the window and is like, why don't you ask those guys that are over there that are in the helicopter? There was no segue. No, zero. It was there just was people. Zero. <laughs> it was just people on a roof in a helicopter that... For, for no reason. No, the, only, the, only, possible, been... the only thing that connected these things was that, that the reindeer had been stolen from a roof. Right. The end. And, and Ace it. had like tasted roof asphalt tar and it's basically just like, oh, this is a common roof thing. Th- the end. Like, that's it. So. If you are as frustrated as we are with this, I encourage you, update their Wikipedia page. Yeah. Link it to the physics page about helicopters. This is where that comes God. into play, actually, because Ace tries to, like, tackle one of the guys, drag him up in a helicopter, but it doesn't work, and Ace falls, presumably, to his death. But no, he's fine. This is a cartoon. So this is where Again, he kind of like comes into, into interaction with his cop friends who tell him that we don't have time for your shenanigans. We're going to a fundraiser ball or whatever it is. 
Right. Now. Like literally it's every the... cop in the city is going to this fundraiser, leaving the rest right. of the city completely open to any sorts of petty larceny to anything you want to do. And so they, like Ace, Ace is under the impression like I need to find these guys. So he he goes. Oh, he is um he is sniffing perfume. So yeah, back that up because he when he fell out of the helicopter, he grabbed the guys one of the guys' coats. So he's got the right. guy's coat, and that's the only bit of evidence he has from. Then he smells it, and he's like, "Hmm, this smells like perfume." So then he goes to this perfume counter. Sure. And he shows up at some weird Sephora, and there is a woman that's there, (laughs) and he is just, he is smelling every possible thing that he could put into his nose to the point where there's sort of like this weird, I don't know how you heighten the, like, there's no way to really like effectively heighten this joke, because it just sort of means that, like, you've been huffing. Yeah. Like, essentially is what it is. So, like, he's been... Like, like what we know is like the drug version of like, you know, like an inhalant, like, you know, taking something like into his lungs, like in an excessive amount, like he is inhaling uh, perfume and cologne (laughs) at an alarming rate. And probably all like the the sample sizes, too. So you got to spray that little swatch. You got to wave it a little bit and then huff it. No, but he is just spraying it into like his his nose, nose, just right in. He is not taking the the courtesy uh, coffee beans that they have that are there to kind of clear, you know, your old factory. Like he is just he is going full hog on this thing and 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 just making his way down there to the point where he passes out, and they go to like a commercial break, and they come back from the commercial. break. I think honestly, the worst part was that they came back from commercial break. This is one of those shows where, like, if they went to commercial and never came back, it was just 20 more minutes okay. of commercials before the next cartoon. It'd be like, all right, this is actually fine. I'll watch this, this, great. this RC car commercial about 50 more times. But, like, it, none of this matters because he c- gets it into his mind that it, it, it's, it's a very common fragrance. This was the worst. So him. The long, long and short of this was he goes through huffing all these perfumes, and then he finally asks the woman at the fucking perfume counter who maybe knows a thing or two about these different things, like, Oh, what's that smell? And she's like, oh, it's our most popular perfume ever. Which he then makes a leap of logic that it has to be something to do with the, um, the head of the company that actually makes this perfume. So you've got the most common perfume pretty much in existence. And that automatically leads you back to the company that makes it. Not literally any other person on the face of the earth that wears this perfume. Uh, look, I'm not looking right. for logic here in the cartoon. But if it's not going to make sense, at least make it fucking funny. And it didn't either did neither of these things so what's so what's we, going on at this uh this perfume manufacturing place what also so is it doubling as for some strange right. reason so for some reason it's also a banquet hall where they're hosting the banquet where all the cops sure. happen to be having this makes sense uh this get together yeah. which is being hosted by and i believe her name is odora alora uh, i had atrocia Ad- odora atrocia odora okay so we have Atrocia Odora. This kind of wrinkled hosting, old bag looking. It's just a jaundiced looking le- <laughs> like leather carry-all. She looked like the caseworker from Beetlejuice. Oh my god. She looked like the caseworker from Beetlejuice. She looked like a stained part of Beetlejuice's arm. She looked like if you put a piece of jerky in an evening gown. And put hair on it. Put a wig on it. It's a jerky, a wig, an evening gown. What else do you think she looked like, Sean? <laughs> she looks like uh, if, you, if you gave somebody an iron deficiency, mm. uh, but then you never allowed them to have that supplement, mm. but you, you aged them, you gave them reverse Benjamin Button syndrome within a short period of time, and then you plopped a wig on top. She looked like if you just ironed a person to death. <laughs> She's very well pressed. She had good lines. <laughs> Not a, well, no, she had a shitload of wrinkles. So if you poorly ironed a person to death. She looks like if you took a piece of bubble tape, mm-hmm. chewed it, like grape bubble tape, mm-hmm. chewed it, and then threw an evening gown and, around it. Uh, and around like started it. chewing it, but didn't like the taste because it's gross. And then just like, but if you put the whole tape in your mouth and then pulled it out as like a six foot long string and right, then put exactly. that in an evening gown, I got it. That that is correct. That might be the closest uh, description. And then, just as you as you were laying the evening gown and the bad wig on top, you just spit on it. Mm-hmm. 
just for <laughs> you were just measure. like I'm done. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good description of her. So you guys yeah, have a good idea. She's she's a she's a rough looking woman. Um, which is funny <laughs> because she's in you know she's the head of this sort of pharmaceutical chemical company. Long and short of it, she, yes, she did kidnap the reindeer. Yes, they are currently existing uh, at the banquet hall slash pharmaceutical or uh, uh, what's the word makeup cosmetics facility factory uh, where they also happen to have an albino alligator in a cage for some reason uh, i will also throw out there that they happen to have eight reindeer that are set up in what looks like stocks with their butts up in yeah, the air got weird. and eight eight individual needles giant needles that are co- giant needles like giant syringe looking needles but like not like a tetanus shot we're talking like probably no, 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 four no, or like five a, feet wide about six to eight feet long yeah. Huge syringes with needles pointed right at their elevated butts. Yeah. Why? These are just because she is trying to remove uh, parts of the gland um, from the, these reindeer in order to harness some of their, their aging principles so that they can defy gravity. Question mark? Because, yeah. Right. Because her biggest, her biggest, she posits the idea that like, the thing that is affecting all people is gravity. And so reindeers can defy gravity gravity by the fact that they can fly sure. and so if she and, gets and that power and, has to be in a gland somewhere located in their reindeer butts i mean it makes sense to yeah. me I don't see what no i'm not questioning is. i'm just laying out her logic here yeah. yeah 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 that's what it is so she's gonna she's gonna put a needle in their butt yep. and pull out this this like whatever secretions come out of this gland yep. in these reindeer's anuses and then she's gonna use this uh for for fashion for, like face cream for, for beauty for beauty yeah to like so you're going you're gonna to take reindeer anal gland secretions, rub it on your face, and then be so beautiful. Be so beautiful because of anti-gravity. It's a solid cartoon villain plan. I actually, it's, it's fine. It's one of the I weirder things. In the world. I love the look of uh, relief on the reindeer's face when they finally do rescue them from the stocks because they've just been yeah. like looking at these giant needles aimed at their anuses the entire episode. And when they are finally freed, they're kind of like, oh man, that was close. I did, Though I did there was... That. There was one reindeer yeah, he was into it? that you looked on his face and he was like, ah, trap. Uh, could have finally gotten some. Could have, I could have tried that once. Could have finally, you know. I tried in college once. It wasn't bad. Says the yeah. reindeer. Says the reindeer. Is that reindeer? Oh, that was boy. definitely Blitzen, by the way. Uh, so <laughs> now here's the other crazy thing. Like, so that, it sounds like we're almost done, right? Because Ace saved the reindeer and defeated the big bad villain. Not really. They waste so much time going back and forth and back and forth. They have to rescue the reindeer, but then the albino alligator kind of gets loose and starts chasing literally everybody around. So then Santa has to come in and rescue Ace, who then rescues the reindeer, who then rescues Santa, who then goes back home to safety. But then Ace has to go back and rescue Spike because he's still at the ball. And then he also has to get the cops to arrest uh, Atrocia, but they don't believe him because he basically says, you need to arrest her for stealing Santa Claus's reindeer. So they're like, well, you're obviously crazy. And then the whole thing ends up with there's an explosion. Everybody's covered in this weird paste made from probably the this anal weird, glands like, of the alligator, right? Right, this weird white goo. Weird white goo. Uh, and then he says, oh, by the way, she's holding an uh, endangered or um, nearly extinct species. Uh, so that's illegal, so please arrest her. And they do. Right. Pretty much to the end. It leaves you with Ace, Spike, and Santa all sitting on the beach in Miami enjoying a tan, and here's where the oh-so-funny hair joke comes back in. Do you remember this part? Right, so it's, it's at this point where Santa, or uh, Santa is kind of hanging out next to Ace, and in, in this moment, uh, Ace calls him out on something. He's just like, you know, I want to let you know that I like the new do. And so he pulls off Santa's hat, and Santa has that same perfectly coiffed hair mm. that Ace has, and he, his response was looking and he just, and this was so fucking bad. He just goes, kind of hip, eh, dude? Oh, and you're boy. like, no. What is up, fellow kids? <laughs> we like to party, oh, no. hang out, make friends, right? And you're like, uh, just knock it off. We like to party. Cop. Were you singing Aqua, Barbie Girl? Yeah, oh my God. Is that, no, what, that, is wasn't that what you're su- doing? Subconsciously, it's, it's in there. But, oh, and we should mention that at this point that, um, uh, Ace Ventura is still like his skin is still oh, he's bleached albino. white. Yeah. He is still bleached white, which looks like 
it was a continuation of the joke, but I also want to say, I feel like it was probably the production company's like cheap way of saying, we're just not going to color. No, we're just no color. We're just going to, we're just not not going to an outline. (laughs) <laughs> which is hilarious because in the next episode we're gonna briefly talk about and we're getting a little close to the end here um there is like a woman with two-tone hair that drove me insane of all the crazy oh, was things the in one this with episode, the bad voice acting also that also yeah. none of the women oh like whoever God. drew women in this cartoon did not know how to draw women because their eyes were always like floating off to the sides of their heads or like way too oh, close together or just like there, there was no definition to their face whatsoever it's bizarre any woman's arm was too, like so the length long. of her arm was two thirds so of her fucking, fucking body. Long. They were like dragging, the her fuck? elbows were down past her hips. It was the most disturbing thing I've ever seen. It was so So you've got this watch. woman, you've got, ah, uh, God, do we even want to get into this episode? But yeah, let's do it quickly because okay. this, it's just so bad. It's just a lot of crazy. Now this is the one written by Seth MacFarlane. So you'd think maybe he cut his teeth on some of this stuff and maybe there was some good stuff in here. No, there's zero good stuff. No. There's a lot of references to Star Trek. That's about it. There's not really any kind of like even funny jokes. I don't think I laughed at all. There's some terrible stuff. I did not laugh a single moment. And, and I'll tell you why. Because like their button, like their, their ending to every scene, like the way that they kind of resolved everything is that in, even, if it didn't, even if it never made an ounce of sense was to just have Ace Ventura just go, all righty then. And that was, that was their that cap. Was it. That was it. Like They're that like was their punchline. Like to re- like if something funny had happened and then they reinforced it with an existing catchphrase, sure, yeah, maybe I can get it. But nothing happened and like somebody would fall down or somebody would injure themselves and then they'd just be like, Alrighty then. And that was like and that was like go to commercial guys or like cut to the next scene. Like we've clearly accomplished everything that we're gonna get from this point. So let's just alrighty then and move right the fuck on. Look, like, so much that... so that to the point that like this was his greatest achievement in this episode because it's the final thing that he checks once he gets back. So this whole crazy thing starts off with like this weirdo random mustache villain who has kidnapped a panther cub, whatever. And he, I love the opening of this because he's like, he's looking at the panther as he's flying his plane. I don't know what's going on. And he's just like, you will fetch a handsome price on the black market. What? Who could have tracked me down? And there's, there's no, you don't know what he's talking about. It looks like he just has like a stroke or a fit or something <laughs> because there's nothing to clue you in that somebody is actually on his tail. But it's actually right. Ace, a random pilot who soon parachutes out once they uh, go over the Bermuda Triangle slash square slash trapezoid slash awkwardly Bermuda naked woman jogging on the beach. That was a little creepy. That did not make any sense. That was a little creepy too. Ace was basically perving on some naked woman on the beach and talking about it to kids because that's fun. And then their plane flies through a, uh, basically a black hole or a wormhole rather. And they end up where? Oh, they end up back in ancient Rome. Sure. Makes sense. And so they are, they're back in this time period and they are just very casually, you know, obviously still in the same. Still, it's Spike, who is a monkey, who's just being a monkey. Yeah. And it's Ace Ventura looking as a stereotypical Ace Ventura yep. that we have seen in every, every movie. And they also just crashed it, a, a piece of machinery that comes from like 2,000, about 4,000 years in the future. Right. Yeah. And so they, they, they wreck this plane. They get out. Everybody's, everybody's totally fine. Well, they're totally fine. Uh, and eventually the plane is totally fine as well. Right, right. You know, which it clearly, clearly. Come on, Mike. And so they, it's just, it's just from, from start to finish, it is them making a bunch of insulting jokes to people, either about, uh, like, uh, like uh, it, it's making an insane amount of jokes uh, about this villain who his name is like Lardo. Uh, La- yeah, and they call him uh, Lardius Fattius or Lardus Fattius. Lard- yeah. Lardius Fattius. Yeah. And so this entire episode is the same bad catchphrase used over and over, multiple insulting fat jokes used over and over. Literal slave and girls. A- right. And, and, and no actual content. Oh, and just, I'm sorry, the no actual content, just replace that with an excessive amount of just bathroom toilet humor, yes. which I'll be honest, I love bathroom toilet humor. Sure. I think it's funny. I don't want to have to think sometimes when I laugh, but when your jokes are so like, I'm trying, I, I don't know about you, Dave, but sometimes when I watch these cartoons, I try to think to myself, if I was a kid, like if I'm just, if I'm just a kid just watching this and I'm trying to enjoy it, I'm trying to just relax 
and and get into this. If, like, would, as a if kid, I was in that I mindset, often felt the need to just relax from my stressful days. Right. Like, would I have been able to enjoy this in a way that I, I'm not enjoying this right now? I can't now? imagine I mean, anyone who ever watched, worked on, saw from the other room, saw a still image, read a Wikipedia page. I can't imagine anyone ever actually enjoyed anything having to do with this show. I mean, like, we, we're talking about it, and if you're listening to this show and you're just going, Sean, Dave, I hate you now as a result of hearing about this, the only thing I can encourage you to do is update their Wikipedia That's page. That's all we can do, and we'll never speak of this again. Honestly, I yeah. hope that through our discussion we have actually brought you some, like, humor and some laughter and possibly some shocking moments. I will still build an anti-reindeer wall. But <laughs> there's anyone else involved with this show. I can't imagine anybody was actually... This is a, Seth MacFarlane's only episode, by the way, so I guarantee he, mm-hmm. like, wrote it and was just like, fuck this, I'm doing something else. Because there's just, I can't imagine being in a writer's room or bouncing any of these ideas off of any other living human sentient being and being like, oh, uh, we're going to have him like get captured and then be trained as a gladiator, but then participate in a gladiator arena. And he's going to go up against a guy named uh, Hottest Shadius and Pectoralis Major. Is that good? Yeah. Is that funny? Anybody mm-hmm. laughing? Is anybody Oop. listening still? Not at all. Eat you. God, I think they just cashed a paycheck and just ran because this is, it's not funny. It's borderline. It's not really offensive. It's just kind of lazy. I, I found lazy. it. I found it. I found it offensive because it was so lazy. Okay, fair enough. Offensively lazy. I found this offensively lazy. And I am not always the most proactive individual or human being. And so for me to call bullshit on somebody else's lazy fair. feels they've earned ridiculous it. to me. They've, earned yeah. it. They, like they've you... ironically earned the lazy <sighs> remarks. The lazy status. Fuck. So there's two things at the end of this episode I thought were a little strange, maybe more than two, now that I'm thinking about it. So one, the plane is automatically back together and it's in great shape, and Ace can apparently fly, so I don't know why he needed a pilot to begin with. And he's got the Panther, he's got Spike back, they're best friends again, and he's got Lardis on the plane for a brief moment of time. And then once they go back through the like sort of wormhole time portal thing, Lardis disappeared. This did not make any sense. Don't know what happens to him, but did you you saw the stinger scene, right? So we find out what happens to him. No. Oh, you missed that. Yeah. What happened? Oh, so there's a stinger scene where uh, Ace is basically like, "I wonder what happened to Lardis," and they just show this other plane that was Lardis's plane. I think actually it would make more sense if it was an alien ship because he's like naked with just a towel over his crotch, laying on a table, surrounded by aliens, and he's like, "Are you what? sure you guys are from the Bermuda Triangle?" And I'm just like, "What the fuck?" I don't know what happened there, but he got abducted by aliens. Uh, still not the most infuriating thing. The most infuriating thing is once Ace is back, returns the Panther Cub to its rightful quote-unquote owner, um, he goes straight to what? What reference material? I can't. Oh, you don't remember this? Okay, so he goes right, he's like... No, I mean, my brain is just like... No, I, I've, like I've... He's like, show me your encyclopedias, because everybody just has like a, a shelf of encyclopedias just yeah. For, for company. Get that, get those Britannicas. Yeah, because company would like come over and peruse them, uh, which is exactly what Ace does. He flips open to the page of like ancient Rome, the page of ancient Rome. It's just like, oh, here it is. They did it for me, just like I asked them to do. And there's like a picture of him, a statue of him that says, All Rightius Venice. And I, uh, I had a stern conversation with myself about whether or not I was going to watch that third episode or not. Yeah, I can't. There was one contextual reference too that firmly placed it in the '90s. Again, another Lardius joke, right? So Lardius walks in on uh, Ace at one point, and Ace is like caught in his shadow. So Ace looks up and he says to him, "Is that a solar eclipse, or did Free Willy just walk in?" Now, <sighs> kids out there, if you're not familiar with Free Willy, just go to the Wikipedia page and add a bunch of shit to it. Um, but maybe check that movie out. But like the Free Willy reference, a doesn't make any sense. B, not funny, and C, just squarely puts this in, like, 1996, uh, which, again, which was kind of hilarious in an unintentional way. Again, like, there's, there's humor that can be, there's humor, and, and, and there's insults that can, be, that can be interesting and that can be funny, but then it just feels like, the, feels like all of the, the digs that he had on Lardis were just malicious. Yeah. Like, they, they weren't, 
they weren't meant to be funny. It was just like, oh, I'm going to insult you. Yeah, like, I'm just going to remind you, that you that to you're your fat. face. Yeah. yeah. But not in a funny way. Just literally just going to remind you that you're fat. Like there, there's, there's that moment where Lardis realizes that Ace Ventura is not from like his time. And the reason that he realizes, or the way that Lardis realizes that Ace is from another time right. is that. Because Ace is in disguise he, at this point. Right. Is that, is that Ace used the word John right. to refer to the bathroom. Which would he make asked him, sense. Where's your John? Which would make sense if, you know, somebody was smart enough to realize that probably didn't happen, you know, in ancient Rome. They also probably weren't speaking English, but whatever. However, yeah, Lardius' follow-up. Oh, just the, that he knew that, you know, because he, he used the, the phrase John, that it was not. Well, that by itself would be fine, because that actually makes sense. But he's like, no right. one refers to it in this time as John. Everyone calls them Jonas. I was just like, no, you had, you had like an okay thing, and then you made it a worse thing, and now I hate you. <sighs> I want you all to die a cartoon death. Put them in the God. dip. Oh, we should do that. In the future, every cartoon that we never ever want to see again, we should put it in the dip. Ooh, first candidate coming up tonight. All right. He's going Spoiler. in the dip. Uh, we're going <laughs> to... We're going to get a, a video or a GIF or something together for that in the future. Put it in the dip. Do you want to know about the Ace Man Cometh crossover special? I mean, just tell me, did it reinforce all the things that we've talked about so far and just how bad this show is? It weirdly did because it was like they had two Jim Carrey characters and they had to out Jim Carrey each other. And that was more important than any kind of actual like plot within this episode. The episode's crazy, right? So, guys, this is actually an episode of The Mask animated series, and it's the finale of that particular series. Uh, that one featured Rob Paulson as uh, the voice of Stanley Ipkiss, who was Jim Carrey's character. It was really odd to see them together, to hear them together, and to watch them kind of interact. The basic story of this one is that uh, some, somebody, it's actually a, uh, a villain called Pretorius, who's this weird kind of like uh, cybernetic kind of, He's got a, he- a human head, but it sits on like a robot spider body. And then that spider legs go into a human like neck hole. It's one of the weirder what things the... you'll see. And it's voiced by Tim Curry. So that's terrifying. Um, oh. Yeah. So he steals Milo. Pretorius steals Milo. You don't know why. You don't know what he's doing. So Stanley sees an ad for uh, Pet Detective on TV, calls Ace up. He comes down and meets him. Eventually, Ace, not knowing that it's Stanley, squares off against the mask. And they both mm. both have like an out cartoon each other kind of thing. So they just, it's just a war of their quips back and forth and terrible one-liners and really bad puns. And they basically for 80% of the episode just try to outdo one, each, one another before they actually start like working together to try to find Milo. When they do eventually wow. find Milo, Milo talks. But he's dead. No, he's, not. he's just, he's just like <laughs> carved up and pinned to a tree. Old yellard. Um, Jesus. He's rabid and shot. Um, spoiler alert for Old Yeller, by the way. Uh, no, you know what? If you get upset about movie. this. Yeah, this. Um, <laughs> so spoiler alert, Milo actually, Milo actually starts speaking because what has happened is Pretorius used some sort of weird mind switcheroo laser gun hidden in an ice cream cart, of all things, to switch somebody's yeah, that makes his sense. mind with another scientist or something to that effect. It leads to this crazy montage of, let's see if we can keep track of everybody, Milo, The Mask, Ace Ventura, a guy named Dr. Quartermass, um, Pretorius himself, and a genetically engineered, brought back from the dead, prehist- well, not prehistoric, Martian warrior man, who is apparently a cyclops. I don't know where the hell that came from, but Dr. Pretorius just found like Martian DNA and a skull and just like recreated this Martian warrior dude to just randomly stomp around and fight. It's one of the weirder things. I know I say that every oh episode, God. but it is still one of the weirder things we've seen on this show. So they all fight, but then they just start swapping bodies at random. So it is honestly a like five minute sequence of Ace and um, the mask just going through their one liners in different bodies. So it's like you hear a quip from Ace as Milo. You hear a quip from the Mask as Pretorius. You hear a quip from Ace as the Martian. And it's just constant. And it's just... It's just exhausting. It's exhausting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to venture to say it sounds unnecessary. It is unnecessary. And the Mask and uh, Ace Ventura were both canceled after this episode came out. 
two interesting oh, things. One, apparently the mask had an M-shaped rocket ship, which I don't think I've ever seen anywhere else except in this episode. And at the end of this episode, um, Spike and Ace actually figure out Stanley's identity as the mask. And I was like, okay, this was kind of cl- not clever, but it made me smile a little bit. He was like, Ace says, I can tell from Milo's loyalty to you that you're actually Stanley Ipkiss. This is when he was dressed as the mask. And Milo's like rubbing up on his leg. He's like, I can tell because Milo's loyal, you're Stanley Ipkiss. And he's like, oh, how'd you ever deduce that? And he's like, well, I also have these photos. And like Spike comes out and he's just got like all these pictures of Stanley <laughs> putting on the mask and turning into the mask. That was kind of fun. <laughs> Weird thing was at the end, they get Milo back, but they steal the mask. So Ace Ventura and Spike have stolen the mask. Hmm. Sequel. No, Shut it down. Please no. Shut everything no. down. Just it's going in the lock dip. It, You're going in the dip. It. All right. I love that, actually. I love the idea of the dip. We should probably... I, I, I have to ask you the question then, yeah. Dave. Yeah. Do you recommend no. Ace Ventura Pet Detective? No, not even for like... And I said I was like pretty much like a diehard fan of the Ace Ventura movies. You know, I could sit here right. and quote them. I could tell you, you know, word for word stuff. We can talk about the scenes, blah, blah, blah. I can tell you the first time I saw it. No, I don't waste your time with the series. Go definitely go to their Wikipedia page and spruce that up, but don't waste your time with the series. I prefer you to write the Wikipedia page without ever seeing an episode of the series. Oh, perfect. Yeah. I, I have to ask then, based off of this new criteria, would you put Ace Ventura Pet Detective in the it's dip? going in the dip. Going in the dip. Straight in the dip. Ooh, then that is a, that's a two for two because I'm following you down that as well. <laughs> I'm following you to Toontown to dunk this call up, son of a gun call up in Dr. the Doom. dip. Wasn't his name Victor Von Doom? No, that's that's definitely wrong. That's that's Dr. That's Doom. Super wrong. Wasn't oh Judge Doom? Judge Von Judge Doom. Doom. Christopher Lloyd. Good times. If you don't know what we're talking about with the dip, we'll have it up on our uh, web page. But go watch Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Yeah, really. Yeah, it's going in the dip. Uh, anything else from this one there, buddy? I think that's it. All right, I think we've worn Sean out on this one. I, I just, I like, uh, just hearing about these episodes that I, I, I have not watched, like, the, the, this final episode, my brain is exploding. And I also, the, the one thing from the first episode that I, I, I is the final thing I'm going to say about yeah, this. Ever. Is that there is a moment when they say, this vat of uh, the Odora chemical that they have, it gets as hot as the sun oh, yeah. is what the control panel says. Yeah. And then the dialogue that they use says, the dialogue that they use says that it gets up to 380 degrees <laughs> Fahrenheit. <laughs> Did it really? Yeah. Jeez. Which, which is not even close. If you No, that's scientifically know, accurate. You literally, if you go to your kitchen, your kitchen right now and set your ovens to sun... It'll be 380 degrees. I just want people to know that if you were to actually put the sun in Fahrenheit, yeah. it's 9,941 so, degrees Fahrenheit. So close That's, is what you're saying. It was like practically there. It's fairly close. Like they were on, they were on the cusp. They were on the if you would have right if you would have rounded up, it would have been rounded up 9,000. You would have been close. <laughs> He still would have been 600 degrees short. Oh, hilarious. Fuck. Well, it's going in the dip, so don't worry about it. This is going to be erased uh, from the record. Man. Done. Except for the Wikipedia page. Um, all right, buddy. So what do you have coming up next couple of weeks you want the listeners to know about out there? Hey, I have a bunch of shows for Washington Improv Theater. They are going to be happening every Saturday night in July in Washington, D.C. at the Source Theater that is on 14th Street in between S and T. You can find out tickets for all of these, witdc.org. We're performing pretty much every single Saturday night beginning at 7.30. So if you're hanging out down on the U Street Corridor uh, in D.C., popular place, stop on over, see some live comedy. I will be there. So Sean's, I, uh, Sean's actually going to have a barrel of dip ready to go in case you bring any uh, Ace Ventura cartoons with you. It's just a vat of lie. Yeah. Um, so I, at the temperature also, of the sun. <laughs> 380 <laughs> degrees I, uh, I'm also a producer for a comedy show that is going to be going on this November in Washington D.C. Um, submissions are closed right now but we have uh, an excellent headliner from the Chicago L.A. area that is called Dummy uh, you can check out and you can begin to see as the schedule unfolds 
the entire schedule should be up uh, at the beginning of, of August, but I'm, I'm prefacing this now because uh, we are closing the submission process and I could not be more excited for this festival. So it should be, this will be the fourth annual district improv festival that we have in Washington, D.C. Um, and so I'm, I'm very excited to be uh, working with everybody that is a part of this group this year. Uh, the one thing that I think is fun and distinguishes this from other festivals is that this is something that is community run. And so there is no single entity that runs this. This is run by all other performers and peers that are within the community. And so if you are a part of the Virginia, D.C., Maryland community who performs for Washington Improv or many of the other theaters that we have, they are a part of this. So it's an exciting way to kind of include everybody in this. I'm pumped for November to see this kind of go off. Very cool, man. That sounds as great. Al- yeah, thank you. And so, uh, as always, uh, you can find me on the Twitters and the Instagrams at Sean Paul Ellis. Um, I am uh, just, I'm just living life there. Let's just, just live guys, in life just, on the internet. Guys, I'm just I'm living life on the time. internet. We're going to have all the information yeah. up on our webpage, too, so don't worry about having to write any of that down. We'll have it all nice and neat and tidy for you on SaturdayMorningCartoons.com. Dave, what are you up to and where can I find you on the Oh, internet? if you want to find me on Twitter, you can do so at DrClawMD. If you'd like to head on over to Collider.com for your movie and TV news, I'm a writer over there. Uh, you can also check me out on Nerdist. I'm a science freelance writer there as well. And if you'd like to find out more about Saturday Morning Cartoons, you can do so at the aforementioned website, SaturdayMorningCartoons.com. Remember, that's morning with a U. Also, check out Sean's handiwork on our Tumblr page, SaturdayMorningCartoons.tumblr.com. What's our Instagram account again? I have yet to check that out. It is. It is at Saturday Morning Cartoons. I don't know why that's so hard for me. That's okay. It's so hard for me to Google. It's, uh, it's, it's me uh, Against posting the world. pictures of oh, the God. cartoons that we watch. Oh, and I, I, a dip. I am subst- I'm substituting out popular memes uh, and just inserting cartoons that we, have, we know and love. I like it. I got to check that out, and you guys should check that out, too. You've been fantastic on our Facebook page and our YouTube account, so we, we ask you to keep that up. Uh, keep commenting, keep liking, keep sharing. We really do appreciate it, and we love interacting with you guys there. You can listen to our free audio podcast each and every week through iTunes and Stitcher. And if you'd like to get in contact with us and let us know which Wikipedia updates you've made or suggest a cartoon for a future episode, possibly for the dip, send us an email, saturdaymorningcartoons at gmail.com. That's going to wrap it up for this episode of SMC, but next time we'll be continuing our CBS Kids TV morning block with some other weirdos. We've got Tales from the Crypt Keeper coming up. I don't even know how we're going to do this. I don't even know what that's going to be like. And then we've got Wildcats. 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 Ooh. That's going to be some fun. We're going to have a special guest for that, too. We're, uh, we're putting that together right now. So, uh, yeah, we hope you guys come back. Thank you for listening, and we will see you next time. Wildcats. Hey, everybody. Thanks a lot for listening to Saturday Morning Cartoons. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to transform and roll out.